Hi, I'm Eileen Bell, and I am with Hotel Talk. Today I have uh, Terry Iverson with me on my show. Hi, Terry. How are you? Hi, Eileen. How are you? Thank you. Thank you for having me today. You're welcome. So Terry is a champion of U.S. manufacturing. He's the founder and CEO of Iverson & Company, a seller of new and used machine tools. He carries on his family's legacy with the hopes to change the viewpoint of the importance of manufacturing heading into 2021 and beyond. Terry's true passion is to educate and inform on why manufacturing is so important and why someone would want to work in this field and how to mentor the next generation of manufacturing workers. Terry founded Champion Now with the goal of moving manufacturing forward, erasing old stigmas and educating and mentoring the younger generations on the exciting opportunities of manufacturing, uh, the exciting opportunities exist within manufacturing. Terry is also the author of Finding America's Greatest Champions, an exemplary resource for students, parents, educators, and industry leaders to understand what the possibilities are for the next generation in this country and manufacturing careers. So Terry, I, I read your book and it is just full of so much great information. And as someone who's not you know, well informed of the manufacturing industry, it certainly opened my eyes. And, and I'm really excited to have you on the show so you can share your passion and, and educate people a little bit today. Uh, so I want Thank to start, you. you know, you're welcome. So I want to start off with, um, you're a graduate of the Bowles School in Jacksonville, Florida, and I, I believe that was kind of your starting point for going into the career of manufacturing. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, um, I was very fortunate to have attended Bowles from 7th through 12th grade. Uh, I was very, uh, I fit in from a standpoint of trying to uh, be an overachiever in everything that I did. And, uh, you know, when I mentor young people, I tell them it's all about effort. When I hire young people, I, I tell them it's all about effort. You know, we're all, uh, God gives us all different skills and all different talents and, and such. But if we don't use those talents or those skills to the fullest of our uh, ability, we're kind of shortchanging our families, ourself, uh, and, and shortchanging our lives. So at Bowles, I felt I was able to not only academically, but athletically and also socially uh, achieve levels, um, you know, uh, overachieve uh, the skills and the talents that I was given. And so that overachievement has taken you from those high school years to where you are today. And a lot has happened in between that space and, and you've learned a lot and um, have done a lot of teaching and have done a lot of training, um, you know, and you've seen the transformation, the transitioning in the manufacturing industry, which is still alive and functioning and, and fully viable today in 2021 and going forward. Um, what do you feel is critical right now in that industry that you want to shed some light on? Well, I think one of the compelling facts that I mentioned in the book, in the book, Eileen, is that if, if U.S. manufacturing was its own economy by itself, and it was measured by all the, the, the different countries around the world, their entire economies, that the U.S. manufacturing economy would be the eighth largest economy in the world when compared to entire economies for an entire country. So if that doesn't speak volumes of the uh, size and impact and, and you know, uh, bandwidth that we have in manufacturing globally, then, then I don't know what would. So from the starting point, you know, we used to manufacture over 20% of the world's goods. And China now probably manufactures over 20% of the world's goods. So we're probably a little bit less than 20% and they're probably a little bit more than 
but needless to say, China and the U.S. are 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 the behemoths, the the Goliaths, so to speak, in manufacturing in the world market. So it sounds like then it's it's critical and it's important to a lot of the things that we use on a regular basis or that are um, a, a huge part of the military, the government, the uh, car industry. I mean, you know, the list can go on and on. Mm-hmm. Um, what's available now for people, the younger generation especially, if they're interested in pursuing a manufacturing career? Well, first of all, um, a lot of people don't pursue manufacturing careers because there's a, a little bit of a misnomer in people think that you know manufacturing isn't alive and well, uh, and that's simply not the case. Another reason is that they, they don't even know it exists. It's not as well publicized and talked about, and uh, the, gov- the, the media and the government has a tendency to measure manufacturing by number of employment. And and so, you know, what used to be in 1980 when I started in the manufacturing sector, um, manufacturing employment was a larger percentage than it is now of of the jobs in in this country. Well, what what's failed to be realized by many is by thinking just that you think that it's a dying industry because the employment's going down, but it's still a large percentage of the employment uh, of of this country. And so consequently, you know, if, if you look with automation and with technology gains, there's more manufacturing done with less people. And the impact that a manufacturing position has and the other jobs created as a result of that, uh, that's something that kind of gets lost in translation. So there's been probably a, a generation, maybe a generation and, uh, and a half, of young people that haven't pursued manufacturing careers because they didn't think that they existed at all. And so there's, there's, of course, there's a skill gap that they talk about uh, in this country, but there's also a gap of just people in general in the manufacturing sector that just, you know, they thought we were going to be a service-based economy, which, uh, you know, to be, to be affluent and to be successful and to be a thriving economy in the world market and in this U- in the U.S., you have to have manufacturing. Well, not only that, but from what I understand, reading your book, we're at a you at a, the manufacturing industry is at a crossroads where, because of that gap, you've got the older generation retiring, mm-hmm. and there's a need to fill positions that are being uh, left open without the skilled younger generation to fill those in. Mm-hmm. So um, if someone was interested in, in learning, well, what are, what are the careers and what are the possibilities and opportunities, uh, what would you say to them? Well, there's, there's one of the things that uh, probably you saw in the book, early in the book, is the massive amount of data that I try to, to provide uh, mm-hmm. to influence, uh, not influence, inform inform people adequately of what manufacturing has to offer. Uh, NAM is the National Association of Manufacturers. And uh, NAM has a website and, and uh, the Manufacturing Institute and NAM.org uh, that has all sorts of facts and figures and employment numbers and salaries, uh, more information that you could ever consume. There's just a tremendous amount of information there. But in terms of uh, the opportunities, there's a couple things. I mean, there's all sorts of different opportunities from a uh, entry point, and there's all sorts of advancement opportunities from management to uh, entrepreneurial uh, elements such as ownership, uh, as well as you know entry level positions. Um, you know, we talked earlier before the uh, before the interview, we talked about the fact that there's such a huge student uh, debt crisis in this country. And so if young people are sitting there trying to understand what their future looks like and how to get the skill and the education they need for a, a good paying job and a good paying career, it could be pretty daunting when you look at the cost of, of four and five year degrees. And so our educational system right now is 
is kind of catering to the minority of those that get four and five year degrees and of those that, that obtain the degrees can actually have a career and a good paying career that they're not flooded with other applicants where they're fighting for you know the positions where there's more applicants than there are openings. Well, manufacturing <clears throat> manufacturing is just the opposite. You know, we're only getting probably half of what we need. So we have few applicants and many positions. So when I talk to young people, I try to make the analogy that if I have this ticket to this World Series, Super Bowl, whatever sporting event, and there's only one ticket, and, and you know, there's 100 people that want that ticket, what happens to the cost of the ticket? Well, it goes up. So same thing. If you have this employee or this future potential employee, young person that wants a job in manufacturing and you have all these manufacturers that are wanting and needing people to fill positions, their salaries are going to go up. Couple that with the fact that technology gains in manufacturing. Once again, I said employment has, has shrunk because of technology gains. Well, with automation, with computerization uh, in manufacturing, the skill level starts also to rise. And then the last element about uh, the job sector in manufacturing is you have guys like me. I'm a baby boomer. I'm near the tail end. I think 64 was the last year. I'm, I'm in 59 uh, birth year. So 64, I think, was the end of the baby boomer generation. So people like us that have been in it, uh, manufacturing careers for a long time, we're going to be retiring. And so you, you almost have the perfect storm. You have, and, and I have one more element that I'll mention. You have the baby boomers retiring, just dying to help the next generation fill in behind them. You have a reasonable cost of education that many times you don't even have to pay. Your employer many times will pay it for you. You have rising salaries and you have uh, multiple job offers or opportunities for every, you know, for every applicant. Mm -hmm. And now if you take COVID-19 and you take COVID-19 with the, the realization, the stark realization that everybody in this country has just realized is that we're way too dependent on things made in China. Mm -hmm. So all the protection equipment, all the, uh, the different uh, medicines and, and uh, different things that we needed during this pandemic far too many of them were coming from China and, and we were too reliant on China. And so I think what you're finding is that there's going to be a revitalization of people that realize that we need th these things made here in, on, our, on our shores, in our country, made by our, in, you know, our citizens uh, from a health and, and welfare and, and safety standpoint, if nothing else. Well, that being said, now you're going to have openings that were already existed and avoid in the, in the marketplace for employees. Now that's just gotten greater, which is even more opportunity. So I'm trying to, to weave in all those different elements and I hope <laughs> I, I didn't go overboard. No, no, I think that's great. And I, and I think if anyone's listening, who's kind of sitting on the fence of what do I do, you know, with my life or they want to change a career um, you just gave them a reason to check out that website, maybe contact you and find out, okay, what's the next step? How do I find out more about this? Let me, let me just answer more succinctly because I gave you all the reasons why, but I didn't really give you the, the takeaways of how. Okay. Um, if you go to our website, championnow.org, there's a lot of information there and, and I post a lot of my interviews and podcast uh, interviews there. So there's a tremendous amount of information there. Uh, one of the gentlemen that I interviewed, um, and, and let's face it, young people today, I tell them they really have no excuse because they have the internet. When I was a young person, we didn't have computers. <laughs> so you have the internet and you have the ability and, and the knowledge on how to use it. And most young people do. So there's a, there's a young man um, named John Saunders I interviewed, and he has a YouTube channel called NYC CNC. And he basically taught himself how to be a manufacturer. And then along the way, he does all these YouTube videos. Then you have someone uh, by the name of Titan Gilroy out in California. He has something called Titan TV. He was interviewed in my book as well. And Titan, uh, does, he does a whole curriculum 
that he gives away uh, for people to learn about manufacturing. And it's all, it's all virtual, it's all internet based. Uh, the Society of Manufacturing Engineers has a, a program on a, which is on a pay basis called Tooling University. Hmm. And Tooling University for a subscription of $80 a month, you have limitless content and you can take tests and get certificates for different subject matters, whether it be turning, milling, grinding, inspection, safety, welding, whatever. So that's on a, on a, on a pay basis. Then, of course, you have shows like How It's Made. Um, how It's Made uh, is, is very cool. I'm looking at the process of how parts are made, but it doesn't, my, the problem I have with How It's Made is it doesn't talk about the careers and the people doing the work. Right. It just shows you this is how the product's made and it going through the assembly line or going through the process, which is fascinating for someone like me. Mm -hmm. But a young person may say, well, wait a minute, what about the person that's doing that? Tell me more about that. Right. I just heard about something yesterday uh, called Shop Class on the Disney Plus channel. Uh, I guess it's not really the Disney Plus. It's called Disney Plus. And Shop Class is where young people, I think 18 young, young people, uh, 18 groups, compete against each other about making things as, mm -hmm. as you know, young, uh, maybe preteens uh, making products. So those are more, that's more dialogue as to how you find out more about it. Uh, in your local high school, there's something called Project Lead the Way. Uh, Vince Bertram is the president out of Indianapolis of Project Lead the Way. And there's a lot of schools in areas all around the country that use project-based learning. And that's what Project uh, Lead the Way is. Mm. So if you're running a lathe or running a mill, you're learning science and math based on making that part. And so it, it really, for me, for someone like me, when I was young, uh, I was very, I was very, um, my attention span was very short. <laughs> it still is. And so consequently, you know, conventional learning was hard for me. I was a very good student and I did well, but, you know, it didn't hold my attention. So Project Lead the Way does that. And lastly, you have your community colleges, you have your technical colleges around the country uh, that offer programs. And then there's actually, you know, four-year engineering programs at, at major universities all around the country as well. Wow, it sounds like there's quite a bit of information and quite a bit of uh, uh, opportunity for learning and educating. So thank you for sharing that. And, and hopefully some people watching will take advantage of the information you just shared. Um, something that, that I thought about when I read the book was uh, I didn't realize how much of our products that we use on a daily basis is involved uh, with the manufacturing industry. So even Disney uses manufacturing for a lot of the things that, that they have in their, in their whole system, in their whole park. Um, and then, of course, you have, you know, ships. And I mean, you know, the, the list is, is so huge. And I was like, wow, okay. So manufacturing is, is really almost just as if not, um, you know, a, a perfect career for someone, especially someone who's hands-on, who likes to work with their hands, or someone who wants to get into management, but loves to tinker with things. So, um, you know, your company is 90 years old, mm -hmm. and started in 1931, so it's almost 90 next year. Mm -hmm. um, you got involved in 1980. So what expertise um, has your company developed and you know, what kind of hiring does your company do? Okay, well that, uh, let me see if I can, let's, let's do, as far as hiring, um, it's hard to go and find the, the employees that we need that already have the skill set uh, to understand CNC, which is computerized numerical control, machining. Um, so I, when I've, you know, I've tried to always look at character first. And, and, you know, uh, I talk to a lot of young people and I tell them that, you know, you have to tell the truth. 
And, uh, you know, it seems like a simple concept, but it's not as simple as one, one would think. Um, so I look at, 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 you know, what is the character of an individual before I hire? I look at what is their aptitude? Do they have the ability to learn? And do they have a pr propensity and an interest in the type of things that we do? Uh, as far as, and that's paid dividends. You know, we, we've had many, many people that have retired after 40, 45, 48 mm -hmm. years. Uh, this is my 40th year. And uh, so we've been very, very fortunate with many, many good people. But as far as what our company has uh, learned along the way and, and become good at, well, we've been good at, at, at learning technology as it's come on because te uh, technology has, has entered into manufacturing in a big way. Uh, most everything is becoming computerized. Um, it used to be manually operated and now it's, then it went to automated machines that were either hydraulic or uh, pneumatic uh, or micro switch controlled. But now a lot of, of machine tools are being uh, computerized. So we've gotten good at understanding technology, adapting to the technology, and then being advocates for the technology in a, in a way to become more competitive to make better parts, uh, less expensive, higher quality, and also to take the skill that was once in a person's hand and replicate it into a computer so that you can store it and you can then have different people with different levels of skill make exactly the same part. Interesting. So a thought came to mind a lot of people probably half the population. <laughs> Major, Major and I have been in school for computer science or computer mm -hmm. programming. If someone has a background in one of those, uh, you know, in one of those areas, how advantageous that would that be going into if they wanted to, if they're looking to switch careers going into a manufacturing? Well, there is a lot of programming in, in computer, you know, CNC machines. And uh, one of the things that, you know, if you have any knowledge or interest in materials. Um, processing parts, you need to process a part before you program the machine. So you need to understand, okay, what material am I using? Is it brass, is it aluminum, is it cast iron, is it stainless steel, is it titanium? And then, you know, how am I gonna make the part? And then once you understand, uh, whether it's turning, milling, or grinding, just to be, you know, in a, as an example, then it's a matter of, okay, now how do I program the machine? Uh, the programming of, of the machine is, is actually a very linear, logical progression. And anyone that's in computer science, I'm sure they realize that. But where the, the science and art come together is understanding how to process the part, understanding what materials the parts need to be made of, and then process it, and then ultimately set up and program a machine uh, to run that part. And then the second time around, you call up that program, you, you change the setup, you put your material in, and then you, and then you make it uh, the second time, the 200th time the same way. Interesting. Wow. So um, thank you for sharing that information. <laughs> You're very welcome. Um, let's see. Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, the video uh, virtual manufacturing camp, because that's your, your latest passion. Mm -hmm. um, what what caused you or what what uh, enabled you to create that camp and what do you hope will be achieved by those who attend? Well, um, I did a camp down in Jacksonville two summers ago at Frank Peterson Academy, and that was a hands-on camp. So I, I had a CNC machine tool. I shipped down to Jacksonville. Uh, a rigger took it off the truck, put it on their floor, and then uh, I had the programs and the tooling and then I took off time and, and went down to Jacksonville and then uh, helped the stru instructor there, uh, Russ Henderlight. He and I actually sat with the, the young people at Frank Peterson, which there was about 10 of them, and taught them how to turn a, a part on a CNC lathe, what the program looks like and how to read a program, and then also how to check a part that was made, uh, both manually and also on a, on a computerized inspection system. So once I did that, um, I wanted to do it again, uh, and and of course the costs are pretty significant, you know, to take a big machine and ship it halfway across the country. <laughs> well, that being said, um, COVID came about, 
and I said, you know, it's going to be really hard to learn or at least introduce manufacturing to young people if you can't be in front of them or if they can't witness or put their hands on what it is. So what I did was um, I, I, uh, the owner of Cutting Tool Engineering Magazine is a friend from church, uh, Dennis. And um, he and I worked together a little bit on some video interviews and et cetera. And, uh, and I asked him, I said, hey, what if I come into the office and I kind of have different chapters for different segments of manufacturing just to kind of whet young people's appetite of, hey, is this for you? And so what I try to do, you know, kind of to our previous commentary just a second ago, is take everyday parts that we made with our customers and, and say, well, this is the part, you know, and the one I'm thinking of is an is a airbag ignition uh, component. Hmm. So when the airbag, um, when, the, when the accident happens and the forces happen, there's a little metal metallic part that's very sharp that punctures a membrane and lets two gases mix in the airbag and explode. And when it explodes, that's what deploys the airbag. Hmm. So there's five, six, seven, ten different samples of everyday products in everyday life of, you know, hard drives for computers, um, prop shafts for outboard engines, you know, um, Harley, you know, Harley Davidson crank pins in motorcycles. And so I try to bring the reality and the relevance of what manufacturing is and how it touches all of our lives. And so uh, I finished about a 35 to 40 minute segment and uh, I just videotaped uh, Sunday automation and robotic loading. And then I started getting into uh, explaining basic CNC programming. And then I want to do safety and then processing uh, in the subsequent following um, week or weekend when I have time. Now, are these... Um videos that are accessible online and is it a membership or how, how does that work good question <laughs> uh, it's so new and, and it's so uh you know uh something that we have just developed i've just developed that i haven't really you know set in in stone the business model but the thought would it, it would either be a uh, subscription model or an annual membership or something like that um, I did do a test case for Manufacturing Day, which was, uh, well, it was October 5th, but I did it just before Manufacturing Day. Uh, a high school in Chicago on the south side, they have a new manufacturing program that I, that I help, with, uh, help them with in terms of supplying machine tools, selling them machine tools. And so I presented to their class as a test case, and that just happened October 1st. Got it. Well, I wish you luck with that because it sounds like that, that will be very um, educational and, ex and I think fun to take or fun to be able to have access to, especially for anyone who really wants to know more about manufacturing. So I guess uh, they could just like go on your website to, to keep abreast of what's going on with that. Yeah, if you, if you go to championnow.org, that's where I try to keep all the information of what we're doing. And uh, I do have, uh, I do mention, and there's a, a video interview and, and a little bit of a presentation on the, uh, I call it CNC Rocks. CNC is Computerized Numerical Control and Rocks. Hopefully that means it's, it's cool. It's cool. <laughs> uh, at least I hope so. Uh, but there's a, a presentation on that, uh, on the Frank Peterson camp that I did in Jacksonville on the website as well. Okay, great. So people have that information. So I think um, I want to, uh, we haven't said what CHAMPION stands for, so you break it down mm -hmm. to change how American manufacturing proceeds in our nation. And now is a call to action. So do um, you want to share a little bit more about CHAMPION and CHAMPION now and, and what that's all about? Well, you know, this is, like I said, my 40th year in manufacturing and, and about 25 years in, uh, somewhere between 20 and 25 years in, I started getting involved in a lot of high schools, a lot of community colleges, a lot of technical colleges. And then I started getting on a lot of advisory boards. And then that progressed into some national uh, 
one board in DC and one down in Florida, uh, Flate. Uh, I was uh, involved with them for about nine or 10 years. And so, you know, at some point when I was in, uh, I was actually on a plane going to Washington, DC, and I'm like, you know, I really want to make an impact more than just speaking to one classroom at a time or speaking to one student at a time and, and really, you know, kind of get the word out. So sitting on the plane, I started just scribbling and came up with, you know, CH and then M and then perceptions. And so then the word champion just kind of jumped off the page, so to speak. And the, you know, the thing that was pretty fascinating is the ION in our nation and I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> it's like it was waiting for me to discover that that could be an acronym. So needless to say, people laugh and smirk and snicker that it's the longest acronym you'll, you'll ever hear. <laughs> but, you know, manufacturing needs positive images and manufacturing needs, you know, you know an award of sorts, you know, to, to let people know that uh, there's so much positive things about manufacturing and there's not a lot of positive images or, or words to describe it. So I founded uh, Champion Now in 2012. And, uh, and then, you know, I was speaking around the area primarily. And I didn't think that until I would, you know, put all these ideas and all these involvements and all these associations of, with people that I had around the country, that, you know, to use all those involvement, all those opportunities and not capture them and not share them would be, a, you know, unfortunate. Mm -hmm. So that's when I started to put them down on paper and, and write the book. And uh, so Champion Now, we're, we're trying to uh, establish a volunteer organization so we can run events in different states around the country. Um, we do have a volunteer director now. Uh, Valerie Richardson is, has helped me locally here. And so we're trying to, you know, to elevate the awareness and change the perceptions because one of the things I write in the book, and I know you, you know this, Eileen, is in Europe and in Germany in particular, in Switzerland, that people in the skills and the trades are elevated and, and considered it with very high esteem. And in our country, somehow we got away from that. And somehow we, we think of an electrician or a plumber or a mechanic or a machinist or someone in the, in the trades uh, or a woodworker that you know, that they're, that they're not, uh, that their craft isn't uh, important or that they're not, you know, talented. And just because they don't have a four-year degree that they, that they don't bring value. And, and the reality is, you know, they do. And as, as time goes on and there's less skilled trades people, you know, we're going to find out very quickly that, that for all of us, you know, in the general public, that's, that's not a good thing. And so consequently, I point to Europe as a, as a model to get back to where we once were uh, and, and get back to where we should hold these people in high regard. And I have to, I have to say, you know, Mike Rowe does a lot uh, in mm -hmm. this country as, as right on the forefront and on the cusp, you know, with, with the face and the name to recognize that people in the skills and in the trades uh, should be held in high regard and honored. And it's, it's a very noteworthy and honorable profession. Well, I love what you said. And, and I have a son that, that is more hands-on. And, mm -hmm. you know, he went to a motorcycle tech school. And he just loves to tinker. And, you know, he wasn't of the book type. So um, I definitely understand what you're saying, that they are important. And um, so to close out, I'm going to show you a book one more time. And people can find this on Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. They yeah. can. And uh, one last thing, you've talked about, you know, growing the champion now and, and trying to get more volunteers. Uh, you're also available for speaking engagement. So if you just want to highlight a few of the subjects um, that would be of interest for you to expand, expand on for schools, organization, businesses, um, what can people contact you for to come and talk about? Well, I try to, I, when I wrote the book, I was trying to address four audiences. I try to um, address students, parents, uh, educators, and guidance counselors, and industry members. And so the messaging, you know, because I, I found it impossible to write a book to begin with, but to write four books was just like mind-blowing. Now, ultimately, what I 
eventually plan on doing is, is having messaging to each audience in a different mm -hmm. book where I take the book and I break it down to smaller books and then put a workbook component in each one of them. But for students, you know, I, I try to, you know, preach the message that, look, there's good paying jobs with, with skill levels uh, that are, you know, that the employer many times can pay for your schooling uh, most many times, if not most times. So that, you know, if you have a struggle to think that you can't afford a good education for a good career, you can, you can. Now your interest level should, you know, in your, your, uh, what you're passionate about should be either, you know, working with your hands or good math and science skills or love to, you know, to make things. Uh, but, you know, you don't have to, you know, go into massive amounts of debt and, and sell off your future you know, to get into what you think is a good career. Uh, the same type of message is, is to the parents. But the parents is a little bit different message in that, you know, they need to trust and, and listen to the research so that if and when their child shows interest in such, that they understand that there's rising salaries and rising need uh, for manufacturing careers. Educators, you know, educators, what I speak to education about and administrators is that, look, you're being measured on how many young people you send to college. And the people in this part of the country and around the country that I talk to in education that are succeeding are, are what I would consider the mavericks that are trying something different in saying, look, there's certifications there's all sorts of, of different, uh, you know, classifications and, and training you can get and get into manufacturing jobs that aren't four-year degrees. And so they kind of go against the grain. And I, I, I challenge educators to look in your community and see how much manufacturing is, is done mm -hmm. because they want your students for careers right now, right out of college, or right out of high school. Uh, maybe going right out of a uh, two-year community college uh, or going back to technical college or community college in the evenings or, or during the day and split, split shift. Uh, and then last are industry members. Industry members, a lot of them don't understand that the educators are just kind of hoping that industry members will you know, reach out to them and say, hey, we're here. We want to hire your students. How can we help? Mm -hmm. uh, those of us running businesses, we, we get sometimes wrapped up in, in so, you know, in our own world. So we don't realize that it doesn't take a lot to reach out to our local high school, see if they have a project lead the way class, see if you can go to career days and speak uh, at their career days uh, and, and make a connection. And then you have, that's when the magic happens is when education and industry partner together. So, that's kind of four separate messages condensed as quickly as I can. So I try to, I try to preach different messages, but it all ties back to the same thing. Right. Manufacturing is important. <laughs> Manufacturing is important that uh, we just can't hire the, the amount of skilled labor that we need and desperately uh, want. And we're willing to, to mentor uh, the young, you know, the young people coming in and we're even willing to pay for their education. Uh, and so, you know, those that are really trying to wonder how am I going to get a, a college education uh, and afford it, you know, there's, there's your solution right there. Right. Manufacturing is an option. Well, thank you, Terry. I appreciate all that wonderful education and information. And thank you for sharing all the um, resources. And I will be putting those at the end of the interview as well. And uh, we will definitely uh, try to try to have another conversation and uh, keep spreading the word. So thank you so much, Eileen. I can't thank you enough, and I'm I'm honored and delighted to uh, to be interviewed by you, and, and I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.